Hello, uh, I would much rather be speaking to you in person in any other circumstance, but I think we'll kind of try to make the best of it. Um, I hope um, I hope what I'm uh, gonna show you and talk about today will be useful to you. I think it will because if you're like me, you started the last couple of months not maybe not knowing a lot about the federal contracting system and about federal contracting data. Um, even though I've been here in DC for going on a little more than 20 years now, I didn't have a lot of experience or work in that area. And the pandemic kind of gave us an opportunity, gave me an opportunity to learn more about it. And I wanna kind of take you through that process of going from the, stand, the starting point of we have questions, I have questions about what the federal government is spending uh, to combat uh, the coronavirus and how we took that from questions to an online database that folks could look, look up and find out, discover details and answers to those questions, but also to gain uh, stories, uh, story ideas and report, lines of reporting from for myself and for my colleagues at ProPublica. Uh, and so I'm going to sort of alternate between uh, talking, you know, you'll see my face, but you also see a lot of uh, stuff on the screen uh, as I share with you kind of the, the process, what we, uh, a, an abridged version of kind of the process I went through. And I want to start out by like saying like this is the end result uh, essentially this is the, the end result here is that we've got a website that is updated daily that tracks the spending and uh, and contracts in different ways over time what people are spending what the government is spending money on in different categories in different sort of types of vendors or um, size of contracts uh, and by different agencies. And so like that was like the end result, but I want to start sort of with our initial foray, which is when someone in the newsroom said, hey, we should do something about uh, federal contracting data in regards to uh, the coronavirus. And I was like, okay. So I first sort of had to think, uh, where do I get federal contracting information? And I went, found my way to this site that you might, some of you might recognize or have seen before uh, called the Federal Procurement Data System. Uh, next generation, it is, not quite of the Star Trek variety, but it is um, uh, actually, ironically enough, it's being phased out, but it's still called uh, Next Generation at this point. Uh, we've come to know this as FIPIDS, uh, because what's government contracting without an acronym, right? And so FIPIDS is like a site that you can use to search, uh, search for uh, contracts. And so at first we were like, okay, so I can, you know, it says, hey, it's a Google-like search that I can help you know, find federal contracts. And so you could plug in, and originally I just started plugging in things like coronavirus, and then I would get a list of contracts back. Um, and we can, you know, we would kind of look at them one by one, and, you know, you could say like, okay, well, uh, you know, if I picked one at random, what I would get is I would get a screen back that had a lot going on. And it would include like sort of who made the contract, and who the contractor was, sometimes even phone numbers, which is handy. And it would tell me a little bit about sort of what, what that was for, where it was, uh, where the work was taking place. And then down below it would be like what exactly the product or service was. And in this case, it was coronavirus masks that were made in China, but were procured by a Texas company. Um, and so, that's great, but there are some problems with this that I'm gonna go into in a little bit. One of the things that we did notice pretty early on in looking at this was that on the right-hand side of the screen here, under the top request, there's a literally a weekly report of, um, this is COVID-19 weekly report, and it's a spreadsheet that you can just download and you think, okay, well, that's pretty cool um, because then I can just, it's already data and I can just grab it and, um, Take a look at it, and it is already data. Um, it is a summary, and I'm going to bump this up a little bit, just in terms of readability. It's a summary of like what each department spends, and sort of the, uh, and then also it has individual sort of contract actions, and this is a at the moment like a 35,000 rows of data of individual contract actions. Here's what the spreadsheet looks like, sorry. 
So the spreadsheet looks like uh, this is the detail page. This is like each individual sort of uh, expenditure, if you will. And it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of columns. I'm gonna just scroll a little bit. It's got a lot of columns, a lot and a lot of columns, um, uh, which is good. Like if you're a data person, you're like, oh, I like data. I like lots of data. Um, and that's also, and like this is a, this was kind of a, a gold mine for us in some respects, because you're like, okay, well, first of all, they're collecting it, they're producing it. The, that was the good news. And it's already a spreadsheet. The bad news is that this spreadsheet was produced once a week and it was updated on Thursday mornings for reasons that I'm not still not clear about exactly why it's Thursdays that it gets updated. And we thought, well, waiting a week isn't really gonna fit our timeline. Um, and so we quickly went looking for ways in which a, this spreadsheet would be you know the, the starting point but not but we wanted more we wanted sort of a finishing point that was more timely that we could get like updated every day because we understood that federal contracting data was updated every day and this site FIPIDS was updated every day and so what we um what we started from at this point was okay so we you know i'm gonna do a search for a contractor that i know of now called fill a kit and we ended up writing about fill a kit and if you do that, you get like three different, three different contract actions. And very quickly we learn like the, the distinguish, how does, you know, that we had to distinguish between contracts, which are agreements and, sorry, let me, I gotta share this as well. Um, this search for Filicate in FIPIDS would give us a um, list of three contract actions. Um, and contract actions are slightly different from contracts you can think of it this way, a contract is the agreement between a vendor and a federal agency, and a contract can have multiple actions for that contract. It could have one action, or it could have dozens of actions, depending on how often it is modified or added to or extended. In this case, the contracts, there were actually a couple of different contracts with Filicate, but there was one for $10 million, um, and we ended up again, like writing about this, this was in May, but like the big numbers kind of like they got our attention, right? So the downside of this, of like doing a search-based thing about federal contracting data is that if I wanted to look at this $10 million contract, I can, I just can't share this URL with you or anyone. Like it's not a permanent URL. If I were to email or send this to you over Slack or something like that, or dump it in the chat and you were to click on it, you wouldn't get this page because it's a session-based thing that we can't share among ourselves. So this is not a great system. We need a system where I can kind of point to something and send it to someone else and say, this is what this is, right? So the search results were not ideal for us. So we thought, okay, well, if the search results aren't ideal, then what else can we get? And here's what else we can get. When you search FIPIDs, you can get a CSV file which is great because like that's data and I can share that with someone else. And let me show you what the CSV file looks like. The CSV file looks like, looks like this. And you think, okay, well, that's pretty good. Like, uh, but remember how much information that weekly report uh, Excel file had, it had like columns and columns and columns and columns. This one, has like 20 columns and that's it. It's missing a ton of information that is in the weekly report. And so that was really like, I was really sad when I discovered this because like I can't really work with this because there's a bunch of information missing. And so finally went back to the, uh, went back to the FIPID site and I saw this the, on the upper right next to the CSV button, there's a button that's called uh, Atom that says Atom on it. And if you're familiar with this, essentially the Atom button takes you to a XML feed, which looks terrible. Like nobody, like I wouldn't sort of, you know, nobody's proud to sort of see this or so like, oh, I can make a lot of sense with this because it's XML. 
But there are two things about this that really made it useful for us. One is that this was, uh, this feed had everything in it that the weekly report did in terms of for each contract action. It had a ton of information. And so that was great because we could find it, we can now find this on a daily basis rather than like every week. The other thing about it is that the URL is configurable in the sense that like you can change the search query in the URL and still get a feed back of the results. And that was really important for us because what, it, what we ended up doing was doing a salt search of what was essentially a national interest code assigned to the pandemic. So the federal government fairly early on said, okay, all federal agencies, if you're gonna spend money on this pandemic, uh, or if your spending is in any way shaped by it, you're gonna give it this code called P20C, this national interest code. And you can search by that in this feed. And so we're able to do that. And that's what we do every morning. We go and we kind of take a look at this, the results of this feed and load it all into a database. At the moment, there are more than 37,000 entries in this feed. So like that updating process takes longer every morning, but a little bit longer every morning, but we go and load the entire thing to make sure we didn't miss anything. And we put all that into a database. And that's how we can do this every day and not have to worry about getting the weekly report and relying on that and missing something that may have happened in the last 24 to 48 hours. So, Derek, yeah. If I, if I could ask a, ask a mechanical question. Sure. When you, say, when you say we, you know, we look this up every day, is this something that you are manually doing or at 6 a.m. does it do it for you automatically? It does it for, I mean, like you can do it automatic uh, manually, but no, we wrote a, a, a script that actually just goes and looks at it uh, and checks it for us so that by the time I eat my breakfast, the database has been updated, which is nice. Now, that's still like, I still am like, it's important that I go and actually look at like things that are new and what has changed overnight but the process of updating is now completely automated so that I can get started on doing the things that I like to do as a reporter, which is to, um, which is to, you know, um, actually find stories in this. Someone asked if the interest code is used only for contracting. As far as I'm aware, it is only used for federal contracting. Um, it's not assigned to any other sort of domain, unfortunately, which would be nice to know, uh, but I haven't seen it pop up in any other area of federal activity, uh, as far as I'm aware. So. so from this point, essentially, what we produce is uh, when we want to like share this information or use this information, we take the results of this Atom file, this XML feed, and we actually put it in as a, turn it back into a spreadsheet, basically, but a better spreadsheet. And our next challenge was sharing that with reporters in our newsroom, even before we built a website for it. Because reporters, they wanna, you know, are my colleagues, they wanted to search things. They, were, they had a set, set of questions that they wanted to ask every day. They wanted to see the same sorts of things every day. And so we use a tool called Dataset, which is, uh, as it says, it's a tool for exploring and publishing data. And basically what it does is it, you give it a CSV file and it gives you a website that you can use to browse it. And so here is literally the website that we, the data set website that we use, that reporters at ProPublica use to find and search data. So as an example, it's, it's a database, but it's a database that you can search on the web, and it's a database that you can ask questions of. And so what they ended up doing was asking questions like this one, which is, show me all of the contracts made by the Indian Health Service that weren't subject to competition. In other words, that were, you know, were given, you know, solicited, you know, maybe it's only sole, maybe it's a sole source contra uh, contract. Um, maybe it was, they, they didn't have time, you know, it was urgency, they didn't have time to solicit multiple bids. And that was one of the things that our reporters were like, hey, my colleagues were like, hey, we wanna see, uh, contracts that were not competed 
because that's kind of where in talking with contracting experts, that's where there's some stuff going on that like they're cutting corners, right? And so for that, like the, you know, the second result here was a, uh, an LLC called Zach Fuentes LLC, which didn't exactly strike us as like, you know, somebody who's like really, uh, it, like it's, it doesn't look like a lot of these other names of the LLCs. And it turns out this is the former deputy White House, uh, a former White House aide who formed Zach Fuentes LLC 11 days before he got this contract for $3 million to deliver uh, masks to the Indian Health Service. Uh, and we ended up writing several stories about this because the masks that he delivered, turns out, weren't, couldn't be used in surgical and medical situations, which if your client is the Indian Health Service, that's not a great outcome. So literally, he did de deliver like a million masks. Almost all of them were unusable in medical situations. Um, and that's what the contract had originally called for. And so every day, I would produce or update this, this database and then like my colleagues and I would search through it and I could share the URL that would share like the results of this query and say, hey, take a look at this or hey, maybe we should think about focusing on that. And then we could, you know, proceed from there. And even if you don't know SQL, which is structured query language, which is sort of the, the engine behind asking questions of this, you could use, you could use different you could just use sort of drop downs and say like, oh, okay, well, I remember that that um, filler kit uh, that I, you know, talked about at the outset. And hey, here it is. It's a um, contract with FEMA, and we can, you know, then go through and and take a look at details from it. And I can share like, oh, this is the contract that we mean when we when we're talking about filler kit. So I want to talk a little bit of also about going from there to what we see on, on the screen um, uh, now, which is like the news app that we built. When we build news apps at ProPublica, we, we try to like be guided by a couple different principles. One of those is sort of the, this concept of like the near and the far, uh, which is to say like, the far view is like a larger view, like if you pull back the 30,000 feet. So how much have we spent? How many contracts are we talking about? How many vendors? Uh, how much have we spent over time? Really broad questions. And then the near view is, well, okay, but what about, you know, what about hydroxychloroquine contracts, right? What about very specific things that were, you know, that they're either in the news or that people are, talking about or that we're interested in? What about contracts that are, you know, of a certain size or what about a certain agency? Let's say I'm interested in, you know, in the, in the VA, right? And so that's what we try to do is provide a, a, a far view and a near view. And so the, the app itself is designed based around like essentially either you know what you're looking for and you're going to kind of navigate to it or you're not sure what you're looking for and you can use search to kind of get there, right? And, um, and what, we, what we wanted to do is essentially like anything that we thought was a reasonable enough reporting question, we wanted to make that into a page that you could just find. And obviously that's in addition to like search, but if you, if, you know, we knew people who might be searching for hand sanitizer or body bags. And so we wanted to make that a, you know, something that like you could just go and, and take a look at. And we wanted to kind of take a little of the discovery, the difficulty of discovery out of it. Um, and similarly, when we talked about like different areas of contracting, you, a logical question for this is why we've spent a billion dollars on, on food essentially in response to coronavirus and basically for a couple reasons, but one is that the government uses this to kind of prop up or help prop up and sustain uh, businesses that you know sell food and, and growers in the ag industry. So like the, the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service has paid millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars buying food so that it can kind of keep uh, agricultural firms afloat 
in what is a you know an economic downturn. But we didn't anticipate that at first. But then that kind of stuff came in, you know, over as, as we kept updating the data, and we're like, oh, hey, we're going to have to kind of account for this because you would think the most common things you're going to look at are, you know, the medical and surgical stuff, drugs, uh, you know, financial services things in terms of uh, people working on the PPP loan analysis, stuff like that. Um, in addition to kind of like individual items like ventilators and masks and hand sanitizer. What we found from this essentially are were a series of stories, a lot of them revolving around first time contractors. And because the pandemic was, has been so extraordinary and the response has been so extraordinary, we decided early on to focus on this idea of like, what is it like? What's the experience of somebody who isn't a government contractor, but their reaction to this has been, well, maybe I could be. Uh, and, and we spent quite a bit of time kind of diving into that hole. The data itself doesn't tell you whether or not someone is a first time contractor. Like there's no flag for that in the database. Uh, and so for example, when we looked at you know, and let me share this back one more time. When we looked at a company like Filikit, who has a, ten, you know, got a $10 million contract, there's nothing in the data that says they've never had a contract before. But if you search for them in federal, in, in FIPIDs, what you get is the results are basically, okay, well, prior to May 7th, they never had a federal contract. So you and I can look at that and go, oh, well, they're a first time contractor thanks to the pandemic. What we needed to do was we needed to teach a computer how to recognize that. Uh, and so we used that Atom feed again in, uh, to kind of test this out and find new contractors. And what we did was we searched for the DUNS number, sort of the Dun & Brad, you know, like the sort of unique identifier for each vendor that comes in the data. And we searched the feed for each individual DUNS number we had. And if we found in the results, in the feed, any contracts actions prior to say late February, we, we knew, okay, they've had pre previous federal contracts. And if we didn't find them, we thought, okay, this seems to be a new federal contractor. Uh, and that has, that has really, like, that's proved right. In, in, proved accurate. Uh, we haven't found anybody yet who has come back and said to us, oh, no, no, we've had federal contracts before. You just didn't find them. The, one, the last thing I want to say about this, uh, what, we've uh, what we've learned about this is that, is that um, FIPIDS is, is great. It's, uh, I mean, for what it is, it's being replaced by this site called SAM.gov. Uh, and uh, SAM.gov is less great. Uh, in classic sort of government fashion there, new and improved is new, but not really improved because it doesn't offer the same kind of flexibility in searching that FIPIDS currently does. Uh, FIPIDS was due to be retired actually in May and they extended its life thanks to the pandemic because people were like, hey, maybe we shouldn't shut off a major government data website in the middle of a pandemic. And so folks were like, yeah, let's not do that. And so they did. Uh, and I'm hoping it sticks around for a while longer because that uh, it makes my, my life easier. But it, once they transition over to SAM.gov, eventually I'm gonna have to spend a lot more time learning about that and how to make that work for our purposes as well. I'm not really looking forward to that, but it's something we're gonna have to do. And the final uh, thing, and the very final thing I wanna say is that we didn't see any to, uh, Pentagon spending in here uh, for until very recently. And that's because Department of Defense spent contracting has a 90 day delay before it appears in FIPITS. And so for a good three months, we didn't see any spending from the Pentagon in the database, but that was actually like, that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and, and until, but like there were several anxious moments where I was like, hey, we don't have any Pentagon spending here. and you know, we're able to resolve that through some reporting. So that's sort of how the, that's sort of how our, our process has went. 
uh, went on this, and um, I hope I hope that's been useful and helpful. And I'm be glad to answer any questions broadly about like the stories we've done, or about like the the tactics or the process we've used to make this to make this uh, website, or to understand the data better. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm uh, Jared from uh, Kentucky Center for Investigative Reporting. I'm just wondering if um, there's any sort of red flags or signals that you look for that say like, oh, there might be uh, an interesting story here. You know, one thing you had mentioned is just that the LLC doesn't look like, you know, a normal medical supplies company, but is there anything else that jumps out or that we should look for? Yeah, I think a couple things. One is that particularly with, with new contractors, like what their footprint is in any other respect. Uh, and so for example, that means like, did they have a website before this, right? Like, are they new <laughs> in every sense of the word? Uh, we wrote about another contractor who formed the company last year, but it didn't have a website until April and then they won their contract in May. Uh, and so like, it's stuff like that. It, you know, if people have heard of them, if, if you know, the, if, you know the, what their sort of, history is so like a lack of a history is kind of a red flag the the no bid uh or or you know no bid or urgency of you know la a lack of competition is understandable in fact it's probably you know i think it's probably in some ways like something that the government had to do in many instances but that's also like it also deserves like extra scrutiny um uh, and so like in instances like that where it's where it kind of fits like this perfect storm of this is a new company that's never been a contractor before that has gotten a no bid contract that would be like okay we should really spend some more time looking at that that was really like those were the really big sort of keys for us yeah, uh, yeah. I, just a follow-up you said like if they haven't done this um their new company well, I found a couple of examples in Kentucky where they're not exactly a new company, but they're, you know, a, like a computer repair shop that's suddenly selling medical equipment. Like, does stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, jump out? I mean, it did. It did. I will say, like, the results were mixed on that because, like, you had companies that did literally switch their production lines or lines of business over. Um, uh, you know, like pretty quickly. Uh, and in some cases that was a great thing. And in some cases they were able to fill some real needs. I think the further it gets from like what their core business is, I think is probably like the more interested we got in terms of like, if they've never done anything like this before, like if they were a, you know, like you had a, I mean, and in some cases it worked out. Like I remember reporting out a, uh, a lot, uh, some questions we had about a Texas company that was a candy manufacturer and then they ended up making like PPE and like we talked to them and they're like no no and and you know like they were able to do it I, you know so like things happen like that yeah uh, sounds like just report it out there's a couple questions in the chat the one is uh, a really good one which is essentially for the stories about stories about Zach Fuentes LLC we didn't determine that the masks were, were you know, the quality of them. Uh, we only saw pictures of the masks because most of them were sourced from China. And it's really difficult to sort of get any visibility about what's going on in terms of production there, uh, particularly with masks. Um, that this was the Indian Health Service and the uh, and HHS, HHS itself that actually went in and looked at these after we started reporting them. And said, no, these aren't these aren't up to snuff. Um, there's a whole separate kind of story that we've looked into and done about the number of manufacturers, uh, particularly in China, that have appeared over the last six months to produce masks that have very little, you know, like we have so little visibility into what their manufacturing processes are and what their quality control is. And like the, this market became wildly distorted in terms of what you would order would be what you would get. Uh, and so like, that's been a big thing that the government has kind of had to spend its time chasing down and trying to. 
there was another question about um, yeah, Eric, if you can yeah. make sure to read the full question. Sure. We have a transcript of the thing. Yeah. So it said, like, did you determine the LLC masks? The LLC's masks weren't usable in medical settings, and was that included in the description of their purchases? Uh, and it wasn't included. It, like the description basically just said N95 masks or KN95s, which are the Chinese-made versions of N95s. Uh, oftentimes, what's in the data is very limited in terms of what it's, you know, any sort of description. And that kind of leads into one of the other questions, which is, it says, I've spent some time digging in FIPIDs and, and SAM.gov and wondering any tips on getting the actual contract language instead of just the data on it. And this has been the largest frustration for us, which is that in many, most cases, we have not been able to get a hold of the actual contract language. Um, some, uh, the ones where we have, we have not, like someone has given it to us, uh, and not through FOIA. Like we have, I mean, we have several FOIAs outstanding, but I think, you know, you're probably familiar with, you know, FOIA delays in the best of circumstances, and this isn't the best of circumstances in any respect. So, uh, that's been the most frustrating part is that I, I've, there was so much, especially early on, there was so much spending that went out the door in such a compressed time frame that I've actually had uh, federal agencies basically say that they can't find the documentation on a contract that, that was concluded. And I, I can believe it, which is a terrible answer, but like I can believe it. Another one is, can you recommend any resources to determine quickly if a company has held state or local government contracts? Yeah, this is a hard one because we, tr you know, we thought about whether or not to kind of do like the full, you know, the full, you know, see, hey, can we get contracting data from every state? And it's really hard to do. Some states are pretty good at this. Other states are really, really bad at this. Um, I, there are probably some paid services that would give you access to most states contracting data, um, but they're pretty expensive. And we didn't choose to go that route. We spent a little bit of time looking at certain states, but not a lot. And uh, I think, you know, essentially like our, my conclusion from, was, from that was we had to go state by state if we wanted to figure out what was going on it, within a state. And I think like that's a giant like blind, blind spot for us in the sense that like what we what we don't know is whether or not there are companies who are doing this at in multiple states that are not you know or going from state to state and getting contracts but not fulfilling them or or doing something bad and then just moving on to another state where you wouldn't know you know that that those contracting officers might not be aware of their history and practice um, and then, uh, and Ben, we'd add, have you been able to find information in the contracts themselves showing the cost per unit for masks or other orders? Sometimes. It, in the data, rarely, but in, you know, in some of the documentation that we've been able to get or emails that we've been able to get, or honestly, by calling up contract vendors, by calling vendors and asking them, Hey, what are you pricing? How are you pricing this? What are your offer sheets? Um, manufacturers will have a price sheet. And the, the sort of the middlemen, the procurers will have a, a, a price sheet. And those two are usually pretty different, right? Because like the masks themselves, particularly if they're made in China, do not cost a lot to make. Uh, the, but we're getting a huge premium on, you know, it's, you know on markup for the middlemen because of the of the real you know the, the real lack of supply especially in may and june early june so that you, what usually would have been maybe a dollar a mask we're we're going for like six or seven dollars a mask and and that's all like that's not manufacturing cost that's all pure profit to uh middlemen who did have to arrange shipping and other things and like there's some costs there but like some people made some really good money with this There's another one, Jenny Schlesinger. Is there a good way to tell if a contract is part of the CARES Act or just general COVID spending? Uh, so a lot of things classified as COVID that seem to be just regular agency spending. 
right? Like Department of Prisons spending money for food. Yeah, this is a really good uh, point. There's um, there's not a great way in the data to tell if it's CARES Act related or not. It's episodic. There are some some of the uh, FIBIT's data will say will mention the CARES Act in descriptions or other uh, other portions of it. But the the National Interest Code is a really broad thing in the sense that it covers money that is spent directly responding to the pandemic. It also covers any spending that is impacted by the pandemic. And so here's a good example, essentially, like there's spending in our database that, that is tagged with the national interest code that is for the operation of nuclear power plants, which like they're not, you know, the virus doesn't make power plants sick. That's, you know, uh, it's not a Stuxnet virus, right? So like it's uh, essentially if they've had to change how they do things, if they've had to change their work, if they've had to, for example, uh, do different schedules or if they've asked the contractor to do slightly different things because of the pandemic or because of pandemic related lockdowns or other things, those should and will get coded with that national interest code and will show up in the data as COVID related. So no, there's no real easy way to sort of say this is CARES Act versus non CARES Act, although what I will say is that like the you know the, the CARES Act stuff you can you know like probably make a pretty good run at sort of teasing out what that is by by Re, you know, both by reading the bill and then by looking at, particularly when it comes to uh, spending by HHS and FDA and other health-related agencies, like you can, I think you can kind of get close, but no, there's no definitive answer to that. Is there a, is there a benefit for agencies to code something as COVID-related? I mean, does it, does it grease the skids in any way or? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. No, um, you know, the, uh, the government does this when there are sort of, you know, like uh, on the Fitbit site, basically, like the other like codes are used for like natural disasters. Like, so you'll see one for Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Maria um, and that and going back to like Katrina. And that's what they usually use these for. The instructions that OMB sent out were pretty clear, though, which were basically like if your spending has been you know, either directly addresses the pandemic or has been impacted by it, it should get that code. And so agencies don't really have a lot of wiggle room to, to do that. That said, every once in a while, I go and like look at the feed results just searching for coronavirus or COVID-19 as a keyword and not as an interest code. And like there's some stuff in there that doesn't appear to be, not much. It's like maybe a couple hundred items that are, that have coronavirus or COVID-19 in the description somewhere, but aren't tagged with the interest code. And I'm pretty sure that in talking with folks in this space, that like that's basically just like an oversight. Um, there's no like there's no benefit to them not to tag it. And there's no penalty for that. Like there's no real penalty for them if they don't. Okay, we have time for a couple more, more questions. If uh... Oh, oh uh, Emily's got an, uh, a new oh, question. Oh, yeah. How do you research if a company actually delivered on the contract or the quality of their work? What's your, what's your starting point? The starting point essentially is with the, has been with the agency uh, that, you know, and what we ask them, first of all, is in the data, there's a, a field that is an estimated completion date. So when the agency expects that contract to be fulfilled. And the first question I think to ask them essentially is, has it been fulfilled? When do you expect it to be fulfilled? And a lot of times, particularly with PPE, the, uh, that date can be fluid. Uh, and so, or they'll might say it's been partially fulfilled. Uh, and so that's the first place to start. The second thing, the other thing we would do is try to contact people who are going to be receiving that equipment. So like with the Indian Health Service, the Zach Fuentes masks were to be sent 
for use in Navajo Nation hospitals. And so it was a matter of trying to find folks in those working in those hospitals who would be willing to share with us like pictures, like, did you get masks or did, you know, did anyone raise concerns about them? That's been, uh, you know, difficult because frankly, like to ask people, particularly health workers at this point, like, hey, what do you remember about like the circumstance under which you got your equipment? It's a big ask because that is not, I mean, like it's, it is a concern for them, but like the, 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 the mechanics of where, how it showed up aren't like, that's not something that they're super involved in. And so uh, we have had some success though in asking people to like take pictures of, of what they've gotten and, and share them with us. Uh, people have been willing to do that. Um, but, but the agency is the one that like, the contracting agency is the one that needs to be able to say like, this contract was fulfilled and it meets the criteria of the contract. Because when it doesn't, like they like either rescind the contract or ask for their money back or, you know, like they, like these folks do take actions like that. They don't make a big deal of them. They do, those actions do show up in the, in the data eventually. And then uh, one more question, it says, were any uh, contracts identified as part of the Defense Production Act? Yes, although not, I'm sure we don't have a universal, a comprehensive understanding of which ones were Defense Production Act related and which ones were not. Um, the Defense Production Act sometimes will show up in like the description. Um, uh, I think one of my, and I want to like do the, uh, uh, I'll just let me see if I can do this while I, um, there's a, there's a, uh, a contract that we found, or a couple contracts that we found that literally said White House in it. Um, so like that was, uh, I don't think this is the contract. I can't find it at the moment, but, but there was literally in the description, there was one that said like basically at the direction of the White House. Uh, and then, okay, one more time more. You just mentioned actions to rescind contracts when they're not fulfilled will show up in the data eventually. Where do they show up? They show up in the same feed and the same, in the same search results as, as separate actions. And so you have an action that is for a, um, you know, it might be for like a, a million dollars. And then it, or you might see a rescission of like $800,000 or so they, they'll show up in the same place with a, probably with a different date. And they'll say modification that it'll be a contract modification that cuts the price of that down. Okay. And that's why on the homepage of our app, like we have, we show like positive spending and adjustments to spending uh, separately on the timeline because those two things occur uh, in equal, not in equal measure, but like those two things do occur where you give a contract and then you, you adjust it downward. Okay, one, one final question from, from Craig Harris. Yeah, our state spent $5 million on masks and he used a small company out of Georgia. It looks like a middleman, middleman for attaining them. The company didn't have much of a record and I couldn't find any issues via Nexus. Thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, like, it's possible that essentially, like, it's not only possible, I know it happens essentially that there are people who are really good at being middlemen or middlewoman, like, who actually can do this stuff and get a hold of things. I think the questions I would ask essentially are, how many masks do they get for $5 million? And you know, can you calculate the price per mask? Where were they sourced from? And what do we know about the manufacturer of the mask? Particularly with masks, because for a while there, there was such a shortage of masks that the FDA said was basically letting in almost anything from China. And then like a few weeks later, they were like, well, actually, we're gonna remove like 90 manufacturers from the list of approved manufacturers because their stuff isn't up to our standards for medical use. And so like it was, that market was so chaotic that I think you wanna know essentially as much as you can about who the manufacturer is and what assurances or documentation they might've supplied. Contract. Five dollars a mask seems like a lot. Uh, if that, you know, essentially like, and you know, you, you, uh, like, that seems that that is a lot. Depending on when it was bought, it might have been kind of the going price, but it still was a lot. 